it's time for another beer, rum, and rock and roll rock shot. This time, John Garner and I are celebrating the 50th anniversary of Deep Purple's eighth studio album, Burn. Released on February 15, 1974, it was the first release by the Mark III lineup, featuring then unknown singer David Coverdale and bassist Glenn Hughes, who replaced Mark II members Ian Gillen and Roger Glover. Burn peaked at number three on the UK albums chart, number nine on the US Billboard Top 200, and went number one in four European countries. It was produced by the band themselves and engineered and mixed by Martin Birch, who had engineered their previous five albums. The band consisted of Ian Pace, drums, Glenn Hughes, bass and lead vocals, David Coverdale, lead vocals, John Lord, keyboards, and Richie Blackmore, guitars. All right, John Carter, are you ready to talk some Deep Purple, specifically Burn? Burn, baby, burn. Let's do this. Absolutely. I'm going to crack this beer because I'm thirsty and I love beer. That's all the reason I need. Ooh, what do you got? Well, I'm having a nice red. You're getting all sophisticated on me. How's the bouquet on that one? Ooh. <laughs> the legs, man. It's all about the legs. Did you let it breathe? Yeah. Right into my fucking throat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, man. I'm going to start like I always do by asking you to talk about when this album came into your life and what impact it had on you. That's not how we start this show. What are we going to do? <laughs> we always start the show with our shirts. Oh, right. Sorry. Whose show is this? <laughs> Apparently mine. I mean, it's obvious. Oh, look at you. Casually wearing the burn shirt. Hey, first off, check this fucking hat out. Can you see that? The party has arrived. The party has arrived. Yeah, well, here we go. I went with shades of deep purple. That's what I did. I classened this whole thing up a little bit. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, you just normally went with the, what everybody thought you would go with is the burn. You, what did you get that two weeks ago? in anticipation <laughs> You know what? I do have a photo of me and David Coverdale, and I am wearing this exact T-shirt, so suck on that. I remember that. <laughs> and while you, as you mentioned, DC, hence I'm drinking the red wine in his honor because he is a bit of a wine connoisseur. Yes, he is. Okay. The second thing we do on this show is ask you when the album came into your life and what impact it had on you. Do you remember? It was a long time ago, dude. I mean, obviously uh, not right when it came out because that would have been, what, six? Smoke on the Water was the first record I ever got, and that was a hand-me-down from my sister. It was a 45 single. Sort of delving into that whole thing and then uh, hitting this. The album itself, I can't, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. It's not Soup to Nuts, the greatest record for me. But there are, uh, there are pieces of it that I really do like, and as I've said ad nauseum, is that it makes me go back and, and dig in and, uh, and find them again, and it's been fun. Yeah. I was kind of like you. Yeah, Machine Head was my gateway into the band. And then, of course, then you just go crazy and get everything you can get your hands on, right? But yeah, I was a kid like you. I'm guessing like grade six or seven in there somewhere. And I had the older cousins in Edmonton. I've mentioned these guys before. And uh, Kevin was the rocker. And he was a little bit older than my brother and I, right? So I just thought he was cool, right? He had a python named Monty. Get it? Like he was into snakes and metal and, you know, he was the cool cousin, right? And now for something completely different. Exactly. And he got me into, you know, Ted Nugent Free For All and Alice Cooper, Welcome To My Nightmare and Machine Head. The next time we went up there to see him, he goes, well, have you heard uh, Deep Purple Burn? <laughs> no. And uh, he's got the kick-ass stereo. Well, he drops the needle on the title track. And even at that age, shit, I'm just a kid, but man, my jaw hit the floor. I'm like, oh my God, this is fucking wicked, right? And being a kid, I didn't know or care that they changed singers or bass players. This wasn't really part of my thinking. I'm a kid. right? I mean, I obsess about that shit now, but back then. Yes, you do. Yeah. And I just thought it was sounded fucking amazing. So when I got home off, I went and bought the album and it's right here. Look at that bad boy. Like what a cool cover, hey? It's a really fucking awesome cover, yeah. It's all the boys, their heads as candles, and in the back, they're all melted and shit. 
Really cool. One more thing I want to add is just for some perspective is at this point in 74, they were one of the biggest bands in the world. Like they were fucking huge. We're talking planes and stadiums. So switching out two key members of the band was a big deal and extremely fucking risky, right? But I mean, you still got Blackmore, you still got Lord, you still got Pace. So that's a powerful thing unto itself. But changing singers is no easy feat. And well, if you ask me, they pulled it off. For sure they did. The one little uh, thing I will add in just in the whole setup to this thing. I don't know if you can see the shirt behind me. It's in reference to our good friend, Joey Belladonna. And Joey is as big a fan of this album as anyone I know. So... I thought I'd throw that up there and give me a, a wee shout out. Shit, we should have got him on the show. <laughs> oh, Christ. It's 30 minutes, dude. We've been here for 14 hours talking about it. That's right. Uh, okay, man. Before we pick our top three tracks, I got some fun facts. You know, I like the fun facts. Recorded in Montreux, Switzerland, November 73, in the Rolling Stones Mobile, which is here in Calgary, I might add. Which is fucking cool as hell. No way, really? It. Yeah. It's at the Bell Music Center. It's been here for a while. You can go in it and the whole nine, man. It's really cool. What else I got? 19 years old, David Coverdale. Wins the audition. Are you kidding me? But he was not the first choice. Blackmore wanted Paul Rogers from Bad Company, hey? But of course, he's in Bad Company. He's not going to bail on that. So Coverdale got the gig and good for him. And my last fun fact is uh, Glenn Hughes. He participated in the songwriting, but he never got any credit due to some contractual obligation bullshit that he had going on. But on the 30th anniversary edition of the album, they did finally put his name on it. And so those are my fun facts. There you go. All tracks written by Richie Blackmore, David Coverdale, John Lord, Ian Pace, and Glenn Hughes, except Sail Away, which is Blackmore and Coverdale, Mistreated, Blackmore and Coverdale, and the instrumental, which is just the boys, Blackmore, Lord, and Pace, A200. Eight tracks in total, clocking in at about 41.37. That's 70 style. Not too long. I love that, as you know. Yeah, you do. Okay, buddy. Top three tracks. So, number three for me, and I think this is actually going to surprise you. Sail Away, you just mentioned. That's my, uh, that's my number three song. Wow. I knew that would surprise you. I mean, obviously, it's a bit of a slower number, and as we know, I kind of like the fast ones. But the, uh, the more I listen to it, I think the biggest thing to me is that listening to it now, 50 years later, there are aspects to me that and I was driving around today listening to it. I was like, I hear bits of Gates of Babylon in there, a little bit of Catch the Rainbow, right? It's very much a precursor to where Blackmore was going later on. You know, in hindsight, I find very interesting. And um, Coverdale's voice, just fucking awesome. <laughs> Big issue. Now, I'm going to get fucking burned at the stake for this. I just wish he hadn't shared so much of the vocals with Glenn Hughes. I don't mind where Hughes goes, but every once in a while, the high-pitched whales just stop with it. It doesn't fit every fucking song. I just find it gets a little bit annoying. There's a track I was sort of going backwards and forwards with, backwards and forwards with. They were alternating line after line, and I was like, yeah, I can't do it. I plumped for Sail Away. Blackmore's guitar on it is just fucking incredible always yeah they're i don't know roughly 50 50 with the vocals really like hughes sings half the fucking lyrics for better or worse yeah i'll chime in on that because you mentioned it he does get a bit much sometimes especially the live version of some of these songs and i won't get specific yet but he gets a bit carried away michael anthony from van halen was like that on album phenomenal and then live he would just it was a bit too much it just kind of oversang a little bit. Way, way too much. Because when, when he brings it down in a little bit of the register closer to DC, it's not bad. It sort of works. But then he right. just goes like, what? <laughs> okay. Right. 
And hey, don't get me wrong. Glenn Hughes is phenomenal. He's an a, yep. amazing singer to this day. He's a I'm still great, going. Fucking awesome. Crazy good. Yeah. Okay, man. My number three. You might be surprised by this one. Who knows? It's the uh, fourth track in the album, John. What's going on here? It's a great blues rock song. Period. It's got that cool riff off the top. And you get Glenn and David trading vocals again, of course. I mean, they do it through the whole album. And that's why it's not my number three. <laughs> it ruined it for you. No way. It did. I don't mind it on this one, man. I like to read lyrics. You know me. I'll give you a couple lines. I like the spent the night chasing up a listed old flame lying on the floor. Can't remember her name. I can't stay here. There's something wrong here. What's going on here? I mean, it's just a fun lyric, right? It's just cool. And the key to this song for me is John Lord does this kind of honky tonk piano thing that I really like. And it's not the norm for him. Right. So that's really cool. And man, Blackmore solo, of course is fucking wicked as always. It's a bluesier feel for him, which is again, not the norm. So everybody's kind of doing something different on this one. Yeah. The piano solo from Lord is killer as always. I got my notes, John. It's a toe tapper. Yeah. I love it. This, this was 3A for me. It's just the constant changing of Coverdale does a line, Glenn Hughes does a line, Coverdale does a line. It's just, stop it. I want to hear DC sing this fucking song. All those things you just said, Randy, it's a blues song, and Blackmore doesn't play blues, and he fucking nailed it. And John Lord, with his piano as opposed to the Hammond organ, fucking awesome. Ian Pace doing what he does. And nobody still to this day does that better. They just don't. He's so fucking good. It's a cool, fun song. I'd be stunned if you were to put Coverdale down on a rack and him not say this was sort of the foundation of where he went with White Snake. Because this is a White Snake song. This would fit in Love Hunter, Come and Get It, Trouble, all those early albums. For sure it would. That's uh, a good point, man. Totally could have. Yeah. That's yeah. where he was headed for sure. No question. He just needed to get rid of fucking Glenn Hughes. That's where he was headed. And that's where Richie bailed. He wanted nothing to exactly. do with that. Yeah, I, I don't want any of that. <laughs> no. I want gods and monsters. That's what I want. Exactly. Okay, man. What's your number two? Number two? I don't know if this is a surprise or not, but I've been mistreated. White Snake continued to play it. Blackmore played it when he was doing his Rainbow. It was like a three hour song on one of their tours. Like, took a whole uh, record side on Rainbow on stage. Ronnie sang the shit out of it. Oh, sang the shit out of that fucker. Yeah. It's such a good song. It's still bluesy. It's the closest thing, I guess, as you'd get to a ballad from something like Deep Purple. But it's, it's hard enough. And uh, fun little fact the song that got my daughter. Nicole into Deep Purple because it came up in a movie called Strange Magic, a um, animated movie. Fun fucking movie. It's awesome. And the fact that the main villain starts singing Mistreated, I'm like, yeah, I'm sold. This is great. I've been Okay, my number two is not that song. My number two is track number three, Lay Down, Stay Down. Starts with that little John Lord piano vamp. Then it kicks into that main groove, man. It's got a nasty quality to it, man. And I love that cowbell shit. Ian Pace is wailing on that cowbell like it owes him money. Fucking, He's just hammering on it, man. I like that stop-start thing. Uh, DC sings a verse. And then Ian Pace does those drum fills that are just... 
insane. Oh, he's just going off, man. And I know you don't like this, but Coverdale and Hughes take turns singing the verse. Not every line, but the verse. And I think it's cool, though, because they, they are contrasting styles. And I don't mind it because they are so different, right? I prefer Coverdale on this one, though, for sure. Chorus is strong. Again, more cowbell on the chorus. And John Lord's pounding away on that fucking piano. I think it's fucking cool. And Richie's guitar solo, off the hook. Great feel. He just makes that fucking strat sing, man. And I just think, regardless of who's in this band, it's fucking clear who the driving force is. It's Blackmore. Oh, no I question. Mean, it's just no doubt about it. And my fun fact is it's Ian Pace's favorite track on the album. So lay down, stay down is my number. I guess Ian Pace is wrong too. <laughs> I'm in good company. Okay, let's talk about number one. Let's get it over with. Here we go. How fucking difficult is it? It's the title track, Burn. Arguably one of the greatest fucking rock songs ever in the history of rock music. And if it's not in the top five riffs of all time, fuck you all. It's just so good. Well, on that note, we did do top 10 riffs episode 53 to be exact and it was my number one riff yeah it rips right out of the fucking gate and here's the time that i don't mind where hughes steps in because it's it's not all the way through the imagery the story of scissors blaze the sky's on fire the woman's flames are reaching higher and all the pieces the solo between John Lord and Blackmore all the way through, how they trade off. And then um, we keep talking about it, Ian Pace's work. It's flawless for me. And I say like Soup to Nuts, one of the greatest rock songs of all time, hands down. It was the first single off the album, John, which it's 6.05. So for a single being over six minutes, that's unusual. Yeah, and the lyrics are great. Apparently Coverdale took like three or four cracks at it, eh, to satisfy Blackmore. Like Blackmore didn't want any lyrics about being on the road and chicks, none of that kind of stuff, right? He wanted more fantasy type stuff. And well, fuck, Coverdale nailed it on this one, man. You get Coverdale singing the verse and Glenn sings the bridge, right? So... David does the sky is red, don't understand, past midnight, still see the land. People that say the woman is damned, she makes me burn with a wave of her hand. Wicked, right? And then Glenn does the, you know, we had no time, couldn't even try, we know we had no time. And now here's where he annoys me, though, live. Yes. He says, dive, 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 dive. And it's just annoying. Ratchet that down about 18 notches, right? What I really love, Randy, is DC with White Snake uh, put out that uh, live album. It's been a few years ago now. But what song did he lead off with? Burn. Of course. If you're kicking off a White Snake concert with Burn, that tells you what that song means to him and how fucking good it is. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, the solos, you mentioned them. What I like about it is Richie's solo, it's like a two-parter. Like it switches about halfway. He's shredding and then he goes to a more melodic lead style solo and john lord basically does the same thing like you said he's just shredding away on the organ and then it takes a more melodic feel right same type of deal kind of mirrors richie there fucking wicked uh ian pace killer like you said just showcases his skills he's fucking insane <laughs> and i have here this is without question one of my favorite deep purple songs of all time if not the favorite one <laughs>
there's a downside to this song, you know, me, I was going to be a contrarian all the time, is that nothing else in this album even comes fucking close. <laughs> Not even close. It's fucking downhill steep after this one, man. Yeah, I don't know. For me, it's not the greatest album of all time. It just happens to have one of the greatest rock songs of all time. Yeah, Does it ever. Uh, my fun facts, you kind of touched on it. Burn was the concert opener after Highway Star. It kind of took over from that for the next couple of years. Uh, Eddie Van Halen named Burn one of his all-time favorite riffs. So Eddie loves it. And this is my gateway into mentioning this bad boy right here. California Jam, 1974. Opener on here. Got Coverdale's just a kid. It's awesome. We've all seen it. Yeah. The excessive pyro almost blows Richie up. <laughs> hey, you put a little too much nitro in the amp. That's crazy. Oh, God. Like, somebody could have gotten seriously hurt there, man. If you watch that, it's no right. joke. Like, they were like, whoa. Anyway, this is wicked. This is just awesome stuff. Burn. Uh, might just take your life. Lay down, stay down, mistreated. Uh, you fool no one. Like, so they do a lot of this album in this set, which is cool. And you get Space Truck and the Mule and Smoke on the Water. But if you're into Deep Purple, you've obviously seen this. But if you haven't, fucking check it out. Okay, man. I have one last thing. Go for it. A200. What the fuck were they thinking? Is that the instrumental version of Cygnus X1 from Farewell to Kings? Like, just fucking stop it, man. That's not you. Like, you're a fucking rock band. You're the precursor to heavy metal. It's the throwaway for sure, right? Oh, God, it's just all. Because Might Just Take Your Life is good. They're all good. Sail Away, like you said, great. You Fool No One has got a really cool feel yeah. to it. They're all pretty good. Burn is fucking epic, and A200 is garbage. <laughs> what, do you, what do you really think? I mean, fuck, there's only seven songs when you take away the <laughs> instrumental. They released... Uh, a 30th anniversary edition of this album, right? Which I'm sure you have. And it's got some remixes of four songs, Burn, Mistreated, You Fool No One, and Sail Away. And they sound really cool. Okay, man, let's sum it up. Any final thoughts on Burn? Burn, solid album. Greatest fucking rock song of all time. Every time I'm driving somewhere and it comes up on the radio, on satellite radio, I can listen to it. I take a screenshot of it and send it off to Joey. He does the same thing if he's hearing it somewhere. It connects people. As with all music, right? It gets you talking. Uh, some of my final thoughts. Uh, I mean, they're coming off. Who do you think we are from the Mark II lineup? It's okay, but it was a bit of a stiff. It didn't do that great, right? So this was a refreshing change of pace. No, no, Again, no pun intended. I still fucking crank it up today, of course. Okay, man, are we good? We're good. All right, man, that's a wrap. Thanks, John. Thanks for joining me, buddy. That was awesome. Thanks to you guys for tuning in. We always appreciate you hanging with us. Let us know in the comments what you guys think of Deep Purple's Burn. We'd love to hear your memories of this album, too. You can find us on all the socials, wherever podcasts are broadcast. Don't forget, hit that subscribe button. And until next time, on behalf of John and I, keep rock alive. Peace. Okay.